<clears throat> Welcome. This is uh, lecture number 39. We're now going to be exploring the biology of stress. And this is a fascinating area of research in the, in the field of behavioral neuroscience. And uh, my goal <clears throat> will be to give you a little bit of history, um, give you uh, some of the important findings, um, uh, both older uh, as well as newer findings, and discuss the implications uh, of this work uh, really for our everyday uh, uh, living. So when we um, explore this area of stress, some refer to it as uh, uh, being the silent killer. And I think what they mean by that is that there are many physiological uh, events uh, that, that go on as a consequence of stress. I think some of them we recognize, other ones, uh, uh, many others we don't really recognize. Um, and we don't really sense. And um, as a consequence of uh, being exposed to chronic stress, uh, this can have very damaging effects uh, upon us in terms of our health uh, and in terms of our behavior. So uh, let's begin uh, to explore this by taking a look at some of the major questions. Uh, certainly, um, we want to address this uh, issue of why stress is considered to be the silent killer uh, and uh, why uh, uh, or, and, and what kind of uh, impact does it have on us in terms of our physiology, our health, and our behavior. Uh, and then secondly, you know, what does the psychological research in this area tell us about uh, perhaps how we can go about reducing stress in our lives, um, how uh, by doing this we can be uh, both healthier uh, and happier individuals. So uh, again, these uh, these are you know uh, very important questions I, I think that we will address as we go along. Um, if you take a look at the history in this area, there's one individual that really stands out as being the pioneer. Uh, in the study of uh, stress, and that was the McGill uh, University professor, uh, Hans uh, Selye, who you uh, see there uh, in the picture. And he proposed <clears throat> what um, he referred to as a general adaptation syndrome, that whenever we are exposed to a stressor, um, there, there's three stages uh, that all of us go through. Um, so the first stage is what's called the alarm and mobilization stage. I mean, that's when we're first becoming aware uh, that we are uh, in, a, in a stressful situation. Uh, then there's the resistance stage uh, where we're making preparation to, to um, try to do something about the stressor, to fight the stressor. And then uh, there's the exhaustion stage. And that is if this stress continues, uh, certainly this can have uh, a very negative uh, consequence uh, on us. So it was Hans Selye who really was the first individual to propose this kind of model uh, for how we go about responding to stress. Um, if you take a look at what is called the two system view uh, of stress, uh, here is how stress is impacting our brain. Uh, it's impacting the anterior pituitary gland on the one hand, which is uh, uh, stimulating um, uh, the adrenal cortex uh, to secrete glucocorticoid hormones. Uh, so this is one uh, of the you know, predominant effects that we see in the case of stress. Uh, the second effect that we see <clears throat> is uh, uh, impact upon the sympathetic nervous system. The adrenal uh, medulla uh, secretes what are called the catecholamines, norepinephrine and epinephrine. So this two system view says that there are these two things that are going on simultaneously whenever we are exposed uh, to a stressful experience. Uh, so what can stress do? Um, here's just a short list uh, of some of the things that, that can happen as a consequence of stress. Uh, we're going to see how there's alterations uh, in the production of hormones. Uh, we're going to see how uh, at the level of uh, 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 examination of brain cells uh, that uh, stress can actually kill brain cells. It can shrink them. Uh, stress can add fat to our abdominal area, which can have a lot of negative consequences. Uh, stress can unravel chromosomes, uh, again, on the microscopic level. 
uh, and it can make us more susceptible to, to disease. So th these, this is just a short list of some of the more important effects uh, that stress can have uh, upon us. I want to talk about the work uh, of this uh, psychologist. His name was uh, his name is uh, Jay Weiss, who for many years uh, was a researcher at Rockefeller University uh, in New York City, and he conducted um, uh, some really important work uh, back in the um, uh, mid uh, 1960s on the whole issue of what we call controllability and predictability. That is, you know, what effect does control, uh, when you have control of a stressful uh, event um, or not control, uh, what impact does that have upon you in terms of your health? He also explored uh, predictability. That is, um, if you can predict when a stressful event is going to occur. Uh, how does that impact you in terms of uh, uh, biological and behavioral outcomes uh, versus not being able to predict uh, when that stressful event is coming? Uh, so these are two important questions that he addressed in um, uh, some famous experiments that are many just refer to as the executive animal um, experiments. So let's take a look at, at how this um, experiment was structured. Uh, take a look at these three rats that you see here that are in these boxes. Let's look at the, the rat that we see right here, uh, <clears throat> which is referred to as the executive rat. Uh, this rat uh, is in this situation uh, where uh, it is in this, uh, confined in this box. Uh, its tail is attached uh, to an electrode uh, that can uh, deliver shock. And the animal can turn this wheel that you see right here. Uh, and whenever it turns that wheel, it can, um, it can uh, uh, eliminate uh, shock when the shock uh, appears. So shock is going to come on by virtue of um, uh, this uh, electrode that's attached to the tail. If the animal turns this wheel, then the shock is going to go off. This animal in this middle cage that you see right here is called a yoked animal. And what we mean by that is that this animal is going to also receive shock. And it's going to receive it at the same time that this animal does. But this animal can't do anything about it. Turning this wheel will do absolutely nothing. So uh, this animal now is going to be getting all the same shocks that this animal uh, uh, receives. This animal can uh, indeed escape uh, uh, or terminate those shocks. But this animal uh, can do nothing. Uh, and then lastly, we have this control condition in which the animal doesn't receive uh, uh, any shock uh, at all. So if we take a look at what happens in terms of ulceration, uh, you know, ulceration is used as a, as a measure of, um, you know, the, uh, the impact of the stress. Uh, and what this shows uh, on this uh, uh, vertical axis here is the, uh, the size of gastric lesions, gastric ulceration. And you see in the no-shock condition, uh, there's, uh, there's no ulceration. You see uh, in the animal now that has no control over the shock that there's a lot of ulceration. But the animal that can, um, can actually uh, 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 terminate that shock and has some, has some control uh, over it, um, that animal has a lot lower level uh, of ulceration. So um, again, this yoke group, um, uh, sometimes it's referred to as the subordinate rat, um, they are experiencing the same amount of physical stress as the avoidance or escape group, when we call that the executive rat. So there must be a psychological factor then, this, this, this lack of control over the situation that's responsible for the difference that you see in these two situations right here. Okay. So this was one study that he conducted. The second study that he conducted was, was pretty much the same, but he, but he altered it just a little bit. Uh, what he did was um, he had a noise that would come on 
that would be followed um, 10, uh, 10 seconds later by the delivery of tail shock. This is in our executive animal. So the animal now can actually avoid uh, receiving the shock by, by turning this wheel. This animal right here, the yolk group, um, again, um, getting the same amount of shock, but can't do anything uh, to prevent the shock uh, from occurring. And indeed, uh, this is our control group. Again, this is an animal that's not receiving any shock at all. So let's take a look at what happens in terms of this ulceration. Um, uh, both the, 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 the signaled and the unsignaled group, uh, groups experience the same amount of physical stressor, um, but a psychological factor of that being predictability has to be responsible for the difference that you see here. Uh, again, this animal can predict uh, when the shock is going to come on uh, and indeed can control it. And, and uh, this animal right here in this unsignaled condition um, uh, I can't control it. So uh, indeed, um, this is, uh, again, another very interesting demonstration about how controllability and predictability are really very powerful factors in terms of um, how we go about experiencing uh, stress. So at the time that his work uh, came out, um, um, those working, scientists working in this area began to reevaluate stress effects uh, upon gastric ul ul um, ulceration. Um, because um, up until the time of, uh, uh, of the work of Jay Weiss, many thought that, you know, the increased release of the hormone cortisol was primarily responsible for the ulceration that occurred. But others started to view this work in a little bit different way. And instead, they said, well, you know, maybe it is instead the fact that the immune system uh, is being altered and there's elevated susceptibility to things like parasites and bacteria and that's what's causing the ulceration. So this gave researchers in this area a whole different view about what uh, the impact of stress might be. Um, one of the, the real um, leaders in this area um, whose research uh, has had a, a tremendous uh, impact um, is the work of the Stanford psychologist, uh, Robert Sapolsky, is a behavioral neuroscientist. And uh, he has been working with baboons in different parts uh, of Africa. And one of the things that he did was to characterize baboons in these troops that he studied over in Africa in terms of um, the, the dominance hierarchy and its impact upon the, the health uh, of, of animals. Uh, so some animals are very high in the hierarchy, dominant animals. Uh, animals, on the other hand, very low in the hierarchy are the most submissive animals. So let's take a look at the differences between dominant and submissive animals here in these baboons that he was studying. Dominant animals tend to have low adrenaline levels, low glucocorticoids. They have very low blood pressure. They have low heart rate. They have very healthy immune systems. Um, and they have uh, normal uh, reproductive ability. Indeed, uh, dominant animals are ones that tend to do the most mating uh, in, in these social hierarchies that you see. Um, submissive animals, on the other hand, have a very different profile. Um, they have high adrenaline, they have high glucocorticoid uh, levels, they have high blood pressure, they have high heart rate, they have uh, reduced immune function, uh, they have reduced uh, reproductive ability, and interestingly, and this will become more important as we go along, the size of their hippocampus is smaller. So we see these very interesting differences now between dominant animals and submissive animals in terms of a variety of, of different measures that certainly impact health. So then um, uh, Sapolsky comes upon a very interesting finding, and I call it his uh, accidental discovery. And that's one thing that I've, I've tried to emphasize uh, in this class is that a lot of uh, really good behavioral neuroscience re research is, is research that, uh, that kind of happens by accident. So as this story goes uh, with Robert Sapolsky, um, 
he uh, begins to learn that um, uh, the baboons that he's been studying for an extensive period of time are starting to eat from a contaminated uh, garbage dump that's fairly close by uh, was part of a, a resort in, in, um, uh, in this African nation that he was in and uh, as a consequence of that many uh, of the animals started contracting tuberculosis uh, and they died and this was very troubling to Sapolsky because he had been studying these animals for a very long period of time uh, and now um, uh, many of them were dying um, but those that died tended to be the most aggressive dominant males and what he finds is the new troop that forms after this, because there are some survivors uh, uh, from um, this uh, contamination, um, the new troop becomes much more social and a lot less uh, aggressive. And this culture of affiliation starts to develop. Uh, and um, there's a lot less stress, a lot less fighting that goes on uh, within this group. Um, this new group, uh, so that you have much lower uh, stress hormone levels and a lot better uh, health um, in, in, these, uh, in this uh, new group. So this discovery <clears throat> was very important and um, it, it really uh, was associated with uh, another study that was being done simultaneously um, in humans. It was being done by uh, this British um, a scientist by the name of Michael Marmol. And it's called the White House Study, and it's really named after um, that area of uh, London where uh, many of the civil service agencies are. It's the White Hall area. Now, if you're familiar with uh, um, the culture of British, um, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, country uh, of England, uh, their civil service system is highly stratified, it is highly structured. And Marmol started to study those that were in high grades and those that were in low grades. So in the lowest grades, people like doorkeepers, messengers, clerks, uh, they tended to have the, the greatest uh, health problems, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, obesity. Um, much more so when uh, they were compared with um, individuals that were uh, uh, in, the, in the higher grades, uh, individuals that uh, we would classify uh, as being administrators. Um, and this was very interesting to Marmo, especially in light of the research that Sapolsky had been doing in those infrahuman primates uh, in Africa. Here's the single most important thing about this study. In England, there's socialized medicine. Uh, healthcare is equal for all civil servants. So it's not as if those that are in the low grades are getting you know, inferior healthcare uh, and that administrators are getting superior healthcare. It's the same. So what is this uh, impact that we see? What does it do to? Well, um, those individuals that are in these uh, higher um, uh, uh, civil servant uh, categories, uh, your administrators, um, you know, they have a lot more control over the situations that they're in, in, in contrast to those individuals that uh, are in the lower grades, which uh, and oftentimes they don't have very much input at all into decisions, decisions which indeed could reduce uh, stress. So Marmo and others, um, uh, certainly uh, the, the research of um, uh, Sapolsky also tends to support this, uh, you know, begins to argue that uh, control is a single most crucial factor in terms of whether or not to what and to what extent an individual is going to be impacted by stress. So again, we go back to those studies of Jay Weiss, uh, the executive animal studies um, that uh, came, you know, so many years before the work of Marmo, as well as the work uh, of Robert Sapolsky.
Here's some interesting work done at the National Institute of Health by this scientist, Carol Shively. And she has been exploring the impact of stress upon coronary disease. And she's documented that in low ranking monkeys, for example, they're very much at risk in terms of developing coronary disease. And again, coronary disease is a consequence of arterial plaque formation. Here is uh, this disease uh, that uh, develops, as you see here. Here's uh, these plaques, which are really um, uh, decreasing uh, the size of these arteries and, and making uh, blood flow much more difficult. Uh, here's a normal artery that you see here. Um, so uh, what she finds then is that these animals uh, that are low ranking, they're constantly being exposed to these dominant animals that are uh, exhibiting all of this uh, aggressive behavior towards them. They gain a lot of weight. Uh, in their abdominal area. They tend to have fewer dopamine receptors in the brain. Dopamine is very important in terms of how we experience pleasure. Um, so this whole um, uh, change that we see is one that is very interesting uh, in light of uh, the earlier work that we discussed. Uh, ostensibly, Shively is showing that these animals now are at risk uh, in terms of the impact of stress, uh, uh, they are at risk in terms of developing coronary uh, disease as a consequence of the amount of stress that they're being exposed to. Again, fascinating study. Um, here is uh, another really interesting study uh, done by um, Alyssa Apple and um, uh, Blackburn. Um, imagine for a few moments that you're in a very stressful situation where, for example, uh, you're an older individual and you're on the front lines of taking care of uh, your spouse. Uh, maybe he was bedridden or uh, um, is, is under um, uh, may, maybe a, a great deal of restrictions in terms of, uh, of what they can do and their ability to get, to get around. And you're on the front lines of taking care of that person. Or for example, you're uh, a mother uh, who's on the front lines of taking care of a disabled child, you know, 24 hours a day, it's your responsibility. Um, if we take a look at these two researchers, Alyssa Apple, and Elizabeth Blackburn, who won the Nobel Prize for her work in this area. They've been very concerned with what is happening uh, on the microscopic level in terms of these structures that you see here, which are called telomeres. Um, telomeres are the protective caps, this, these red caps that you see here uh, on chromosomes. Uh, and those telomeres prevent uh, degradation that can occur. And that degra degradation can occur, uh, especially when individuals are in very stressful situations. So again, they've been exploring this. The telomeres are actually damaged in chronically stressed women, for example, who are caring for a disabled child or caring for uh, another adult. And they have developed, um, and Blackburn has developed, uh, you know, we know that this enzyme telomerase can repair the damage. And indeed, she uh, has been able to um, uh, bioengineer uh, this telomerase uh, that can be used to repair the damage that we see to chromosomes. So again, this is really important and significant research uh, that at the microscopic level, you have changes that are occurring in terms of chromosomes. Uh, so uh, again, very, very um, important work. Um, another important study, Tess Roseboom, about the uh, the Dutch famine that occurred during World War II during the occupation of uh, the Netherlands. And uh, she studied pregnant Dutch women uh, who uh, their offspring, uh, these were women that experienced very chronic stress and malnutrition uh, during uh, uh, World War II. And what she found was that the children of these pregnant women, again, they were exposed to, to this famine, uh, they tended to be smaller than normal, they were more susceptible to diabetes, uh, more cardiovascular disease, obesity, psychotic-based ba disorders, neurological defects. 
Um, so again, the, the impact of stress uh, in this situation can be uh, overwhelming in terms of its impact upon uh, um, uh, uh, the developing uh, organism, in this case, children of these pregnant women uh, who had been exposed to that famine. Uh, so again, more information about the impact, the very important impact of stress uh, upon our, our lives. Uh, another researcher, Bruce McEwen at Rockefeller University, has been taking a look at how chronic stress uh, influences uh, one structure in the brain, the hippocampus. Now, one of the things that he does uh, in these experiments uh, is he takes animals, for example, and chronically exposes them to uh, shock, okay, on a, uh, you know, peri periodic shock over a number of days. They don't know when it's coming. They can't anticipate it. They can't control it. In other situations, what they do is they take a look at animals uh, that are uh, dominant animals uh, in the social uh, hierarchy or they're submissive animals. Uh, those uh, submissive animals are ones that really are exposed to chronic stress by, by virtue of the amount of fighting uh, and aggressive behavior that they're exposed to uh, that's being inflicted by dominant animals. So here's what they find. When you take a look at the neurons in the hippocampus uh, in a non-stressed uh, animal, uh, you see um, that, uh, you know, this is a, a normal uh, neuron that you see here. But when you take a look at an animal that's been exposed to chronic stress, uh, there's some atrophy that takes place uh, in the hippocampus, in the, in the neuron. So, that, so it's smaller. And we know that the hippocampus of subordinate rats looks like that of a chronically stressed rat. So indeed, this, this shows you know, um, uh, very clearly uh, that this part of the brain is being impacted uh, as a consequence of stress. Um, <clears throat> this really has led to a whole another um, gro major growth area uh, in, in the field of behavioral neuroscience. It's really the intersection of psychology and medicine. It's called psychoneuroimmunology, where we're studying the relationship between the nervous system and the immune system and what impact these experiences have, especially stressful experience in terms of altering uh, our immune system. Um, one of the important things that takes place, you know, following stress is the mobilization of what are called cytokines. These are actually, these are really some nice photos of, of these cytokines, which uh, can trigger symptoms of illness uh, as a reaction to stress. So one of the things that happens as a consequence of stress is that these cytokines are being uh, mobilized. Um, and uh, this is all part of activation of your immune system. Uh, your activation of your immune system is crucial uh, for the production of uh, what we call natural killer cells, leukocytes, and these cytokines. And again, these cytokines are triggering these really important symptoms of illness uh, as a reaction to uh, being exposed to a stressful situation. So prolonged stress in the immune system, what happens? Well, our body is being damaged. Uh, you're getting dramatic increases that are occurring in terms of cortisol, uh, reduced synthesis of proteins, uh, increased likelihood uh, of illness, principally because your immune system is being compromised. So that's, you know, very, uh, obviously very important in terms of what, what is happening as a consequence of stress. So prolonged stress, in the hippocampus, one of the things that we know is that um, uh, if metabolic activity uh, is too high, and it's too high in the hippocampus, neurons become very sensitive, and those neurons uh, can be damaged uh, by overstimulation. They can be damaged by various toxins. You become more susceptible to them. So stress is really impairing uh, <coughs> the production the, you know, how your hippocampal neurons are adapting uh, and deep prolonged stress can really harm the hippocampus. And we know that that part of the brain is very much involved in memory. And we'll get into that in our, in our, uh, one of our uh, future lectures when we're in the area of uh, uh, studying stress. 
uh, studying stress and studying the learning of memory. Uh, so when we take a look at disorders like uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, one of the things that we know uh, is that um, uh, we see this in people that are exposed to terrifying experiences, sometimes you know, chronic in nature. And um, they have these really distressing recollections. They have nightmares. Uh, they have these uh, reminders all the time uh, of these uh, events. And a lot of times exaggerated arousal in response to various environmental um, uh, cues uh, like noises, for example. So this is all part of the syndrome that is called PTSD. And one of the things that we know is that an individual uh, who is di diagnosed with PTSD, they tend to have a smaller than average hippocampus. So here's the hippocampus that you see right here uh, in an individual that's been exposed to chronic stress. Uh, and indeed is a PTSD uh, individual, uh, and take a look at uh, the hippocampus in a normal uh, uh, subject. Again, you see uh, that this is, in appearance, is much different uh, than what we see in the case of this atrophy that is occurring uh, in an individual that is chronically exposed to stress. So again, this is uh, you know something that uh, seems to be occurring. Um, uh, in individuals that are exposed to stress and, and uh, uh, in a chronic way, and those individuals simply might not be able to combat uh, the impact of stress, and they become much more uh, vulnerable uh, to the damaging effects uh, of stress. Uh, there are some methods, of course, for treating stress-related disorders. Certainly, um, you know, the single most important tactic that we can use to prevent the effects of stress is to give people control. Give them control over their daily living situations. Give them control in terms of input that they uh, uh, are having in terms of their, uh, their jobs and their professions. Uh, that, that is important. We also have uh, certainly um, uh, techniques like cognitive behavioral therapy in which a person learns to manage uh, stressful experiences, they learn to relax. Uh, it's a major therapy now in the field of clinical psychology. And of course we also have uh, various anti-anxiety uh, drug therapies that can be used. Um, things like benzodiazepines uh, very frequently are used. Um, it's the combination of these drug therapies and these cognitive therapies that are pretty much in the norm uh, these days in terms of uh, uh, treating uh, uh, stress-related disorders. So other considerations in terms of stress prevention, certainly the practicing of mindfulness. Uh, which we're focusing on meditation and, and being in the present. Uh, you know, there's a very strong influence from uh, Buddhists, from Buddhism and other Eastern religions. Uh, that, again, for for many individuals, this is uh, um, a very uh, powerful way of uh, of, of stress uh, prevention. Um, and increasingly, uh, studies are being done uh, to take a look uh, at um, uh, what is happening uh, as a consequence of mindfulness and, and uh, practicing, for example, Eastern religions in terms of, you know, if we explore neural imaging in those individuals that practice mindfulness, what happens uh, in terms of uh, brain changes? So this is, uh, you know, an important area of research. Uh, and this whole idea of control that we talked about earlier is um, a major factor. Uh, in terms of the etiology of um, uh, stress-related disorders uh, and uh, being able to um, engage an uh, in individual in some kind of mindfulness training, for example, or CBT or, or in combination with drugs, for example, anti-anxiety drugs. These are important methods uh, for helping individuals that may be suffering from uh, the impact uh, of, of stress. So stress, the silent killer for sure. Uh, this is one of the major factors that's involved uh, uh, in terms of uh, compromising uh, 
our health. Uh, so that uh, brings us to a close uh, in this uh, particular topic. Uh, and we'll be moving on to uh, an exploration of um, uh, the study of uh, learning and memory and the biology of learning and memory.